living with uncertainty can take its toll. The normal day-to-day is replaced with fear, worry, doubt. When our normal is disrupted, our surroundings begin to feel weak. Foundations begin to rattle. Our lives become disoriented. As time goes on, we begin to lose sight of the one constant on our journey. Jesus. The fear is consuming. The worry, draining. The doubt, painful. Even in our darkest moments, when the last thread of hope has unraveled from our being, we must dwell on truth. We must remember, no matter what is happening around us, God is still sovereign. Today, let us dwell on the truth of Easter. The stone has been rolled away. The grave has been rendered powerless. Death has transformed to life. In our fear, He is still risen. In our worry, He is still victorious. In our doubt, He is still alive. When everything seems hopeless, the hope of Easter remains. Good evening, Liberty Baptist Church. I trust you enjoyed a wonderful Easter Sunday this morning and the service Easter at home was a blessing and a help to you as we think about our resurrected Savior. Such a strange Easter Sunday, hasn't it been? I believe this is my 32nd Easter being a Christian and I'm pretty sure this is the first time that I've not gathered together uh, with other believers in God's house. Um, Today, this was our fifth Easter Sunday in Orange County. And it's the first time that our family, since we moved here, had Easter dinner at home. Every other Easter Sunday, we're out in the courtyard enjoying uh, those barbecue beef sandwiches that uh, Miss Joanne and others put together with chips and a soda, uh, trying to meet and greet and talk to usually one of the couple hundred first-time guests that will come on an Easter Sunday. We didn't do any of that today. I am thankful for the thousands of people that viewed the service this morning, and I understand that sometimes a view is... Uh, If somebody jumps on to listen to one song, that's counted as a view. And only eternity will reveal all that God did. Uh, But we are thankful for the responses that we received and that we followed up on today. And we're praying there will be fruit that remains, an eternal impact from our Easter services this morning and from like-minded churches around the world. Thank you. I just want to say a quick thank you to our church family for the way that you've responded and you've adjusted and and you've stayed involved through this challenging time that none of us would have, would have chosen. Our church family, as we've gone to all online services, we've, we've had great, great numbers of people. Um, your online giving has been tremendous. People mailing in their offerings. Your service, I've heard of people in our church dropping off groceries for others and, and uh, some people in our church dropping things off to be a help to nurses and doctors at hospitals and folks texting people and phone calls and emails and and uh, text messages and social media and just a plethora of ways that that our church family has sought to truly reach out to those that they can. And I, as your pastor, I just want to say thank you. Um, I also want to say thank you for the spirit that you've had and, and the faith that you've shown. And may I say, if you're listening to this and you say, that's not me. I've been discouraged. I'm fearful. I'm anxious. I've had anxiety through this. My, my faith is not stronger. My faith is weaker. I want to say to you right now, would you let us know? Would you reach out? We want to do whatever we can to help you, to pray with you, to talk with you, to serve you. And uh, we're doing everything we can from this end with every form of communication we can think of other than face-to-face communication to try to reach out and minister uh, to the people in our church ministry and in our school ministry. But that's a two-way street. Would you let us know if there's something that you're struggling with, something that you need? Um, I have a list of people that I'm praying for that have been impacted by this whole situation. If that's you, maybe there's a health need or a family member or a, a job situation or a financial situation. Again, maybe you're struggling spiritually. Whatever it might be, just because we're not able to gather together here, we are still a church family. And I want to do whatever I can to serve you. Tonight, 
uh, you're going to have the special treat to hear from Pastor Tomlinson. It was probably a, a week or two ago, I was considering and pondering our Easter Sunday night service. And I thought, you know, it seemed like maybe the Lord put it on my, on my heart, or I just thought about it, I'm not sure exactly. I, I, I take it that it was from the Lord that I think Pastor Tomlinson would be a great voice for us to hear from at this time. And he's been such an encouragement to me through this whole shutdown and, and his, his words of encouragement and communication as I've sought to lead our church through this unprecedented season. He's been such a blessing and encouragement uh, to me during this time, but also uh, for many, many years. And uh, God has used Pastor and Mrs. Tomlinson in amazing ways all around our world and is still using them, and I'm thankful for it. His message tonight is not lengthy, uh, but I would encourage you to listen carefully I believe it'll be a timely, helpful message for exactly what we need tonight. This coming week uh, at Liberty is, is kind of our normal, our new normal for the time being, our short-term normal. Uh, we'll have our interactive family service Wednesday at 7. Then next Sunday, Sunday morning, Lord willing, we're going to be back in our book, our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Acts. And next Sunday night, you'll not want to miss next Sunday night's service at 5 o'clock. We're going to hear from several of our missionaries from around the world. And it's a good thing to remind us, number one, we're not the only country walking through these, these strange days. And number two, the need for the gospel uh, continues to press on in the midst of these difficulties. And so um, next Sunday night, I think you'll be blessed as we hear from several of our missionaries from around the world. We'll hear what's happening in their countries and how they're navigating these times and to hear from them on some words of encouragement on how we uh, should continue to pray and proceed in our efforts. We've, throughout all of this, we're continuing to support uh, our missionaries on a monthly basis and doing all that we can uh, to make a difference uh, for the sake of the gospel around the world. Well, I guess that's all I've got to say. I feel like I want to keep talking because I miss talking to our church family. I miss seeing you, and uh, I can't wait for the time when we're all going to be back together again. Thank you for your heart for the church your heart for God, your heart for His Word. Thank you for taking the time to tune back in tonight. Uh, also, if that service was a blessing to you this morning, uh, it's up on our Vimeo page, our church Vimeo page. It's also up on our church YouTube page. It's on our Facebook page. You can shoot that link out to anybody that you like that might be helped. I don't know about you, but I'm going to be going back just to listen to some of those songs. I, I had revival in my living room this morning listening to those songs with our family. And I'm going to encourage you to do the same thing, to go back and and to enjoy those and listen to those, uh, if you will. Well, I guess that's all we need to talk about. I guess I should be quiet. We're going to let you hear one of those songs from this morning again tonight. Listen to that song, and then Pastor Tomlinson will come to preach. God bless you. I'm praying for you. If we can do anything for you, email us, call us, text us, let us know. We love you. We can't wait to see you. God be with you till we meet again.
I want to thank Pastor Thompson for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight and to uh, greet the uh, people of Liberty. Uh, when, when Brother Thompson asked me to address the people of Liberty on Easter Sunday evening, the first word that popped into my mind was the word hope. Hope. H-O-P-E. Hope. The reality is that I've never seen a time when our world is in more need of hope than today. The COVID-19 virus has changed everything about our world. It's easy to become fearful when there's so much uncertainty. And I want you to know that it's not only affecting those of us here in America, but it's affecting people all over the world. There is fear and uncertainty on a global scale. The past few days, I have received messages, texts, and emails from friends in China, Vietnam, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, India, as well as a few other countries, checking on us. They're worried about Gail and, and, and I. They're seen, wanting to know how we are. They're also worried about themselves. People all over the world are having a difficult time having hope. And yet, if there's anything that our world needs today, it's hope. The good news is that our God is a God of hope. Now, when the Bible uses this, the, the term hope, it's not using the word like we often do. When we say, I hope, here's what we normally mean. We normally mean this. I don't think it's going to happen, but I'm holding out this uh, slim chance that it might happen. Therefore, I hope that it will. That's not how God uses the word hope. The Bible definition of hope is different. Strong's Concordance says the meaning of hope is to wait with joy and full confidence. To wait with joy and full confidence. We live in a sin-cursed world. We're seeing the effects of that right now in this global pandemic. But nothing that happens in our world takes God by surprise. Hope is the ability to face the disappointments of life and wait upon God with joy and full confidence that God is in control, everything is going to be all right. The book of Hebrews tells us that hope is an anchor of the soul. If there is ever a time for God's people to draw closer to Him and to each other, that time is now. You may be asking tonight, well, how can I have hope when I lost my job? How can I have hope when all around me all I hear is bad news? How do I wait with joy and confidence? That's what I want to talk with you about tonight. Simon Peter said this in 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 3. He talked about this matter of hope. And he gave us the, the, uh, the understanding of how we are to have hope. If you have your Bible with you tonight, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, the Bible says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, Peter said, God builds hope in us because we understand that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. God wants His people to have a strong confidence that enables us to live by faith. This confidence is called hope, and it is anchored in the promises of God. It is assured by the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the first Easter Sunday morning 2,000 years ago. Many, many years ago, John Bunyan wrote from a, from a, pil, from a, uh, from a, a prison cell, a book that changed America. It had a great impact upon America. It's called Pilgrim's Progress. In that book, John Bunyan described a time when the main character, Christian, was captured by a giant called Despair. Christian was held in this, in this, in this uh, dungeon called Doubting Castle. For several days, uh, Christian was doubting, and he was in that, in that uh, prison in Doubting Castle. But after several years of doubt and despair, in the, in the allegory, Christian began to pray. And as he began to pray, he remembered that he had a key. And that key would unlock any door in Doubting Castle. The key was called the promises of God. As soon as Christian realized that he had that key called the promises of God, he was able to open the door and leave despair and walk out of Doubting Castle. I don't know about you, but I thank God this morning, or thank God tonight, that we have that key of the promises of God. Many times that's what God has used to help me to get out of doubting castle and out of despair. Psalm 31, 24, the Bible says, Be of good courage, be, he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Psalm 33, 18, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. You remember the story of King David being hunted by Saul? King David was hunted by Saul for, we're not sure exactly how long, but somewhere perhaps between eight and ten years, if you include the four years that he was in, in Ziklag. So for years, perhaps up to ten years, David was hunted by Saul. 
And yet David was a man of great faith. He was human, though. And there were times whenever, even though he was trusting God, even though he believed God, even though he knew that God had placed him in this position, had called him to be king of Israel, and that someday he would be king of Israel, David was human. And sometimes he gave in to despair. Three times in two of his psalms he cried out in times of despair. And he used the same words. Psalm 42.5, Psalm 42.11, Psalm 43.5. Listen to these words. David asked himself this. He said, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why am I cast down? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him. You see, David realized that even though he was in despair, and even though that, that he was his whole his soul was, was cast down and disquieted, yet he had the promises of God. He had the key to get out of despair and walk out of doubting castle. And God wants us to use that same key key today. God does not want us in despair. He does not want us in discouragement. He wants us to trust Him and use that key of the promises of God. Romans 8, 24 says we are saved by hope. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 says we rejoice in hope. Romans chapter 15 and verse 13 says now the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing. Now listen to that again. Romans 15 through 13. The God of hope. He is the God of hope. Our God is the God of hope of that confidence, that trust in Him. Fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Well, believing what? Believing the promises of God. That's the key to getting out of despair. Trusting God's promises. Romans 15, 13, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. The greatest evidence that we can believe the promises of God and have hope I want to say to you on this Easter Sunday morning or Easter Sunday evening is the promises of God. The fact that God, that Jesus Christ resurrected from the tomb, the empty tomb. Now tonight, I want to give you just two resurrection truths that, I, that can give you hope. Number one, your eternity is secure because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ rose again, your eternity, your home in heaven is secure. Death is a fearful enemy. But Jesus made an incredible promise in John chapter 11. If you have a Bible with you tonight there at home, open your Bible to John chapter 11. And let me show you some of these promises. and Specifically, one promise that Jesus made when it came to the matter of eternal life. In John chapter 11, the story is of Martha and Lazarus and Mary. These were friends of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, death is a fearful enemy. Um, it's, it's, it's an enemy for all of us. Lazarus and his two sisters were friends of the Lord Jesus. Lazarus became sick, and his sister sent a message to Jesus to come and to heal him. We pick up the reading in John chapter 11. A certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment, wiped his feet with his, her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. They wanted Jesus to come and to heal their brother. Verse 4 says this, When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. There wasn't an issue of Jesus not loving Lazarus and Martha and, and, and Mary. He cared about them. And yet he knew it was best that he not immediately respond because something greater was going to come out of this heartache. Verse 6, When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. So Jesus deliberately delayed going back to where he could heal Lazarus. After that, he saith to his disciples, Let us go again unto Judea. Now let's pick up the, the, the reading in verse 17. So Jesus goes back. Uh, Lazarus, in the meantime, had died. Verse 17, Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. So he had, he had died, and they had buried him. He had been there in that grave for four days. Now, obviously, Mary and Martha were disappointed. And it's understandable. They were disappointed. Um, Jesus did not immediately re respond to their request. They knew that Jesus had the power to keep Lazarus from dying. And, and they sent for him. They said, Jesus, would you come? Would you help us? And Jesus did not respond. It's understandable 
that they were disappointed. We're often the same way. We're in some kind of a heartache or some kind of a tragedy or some kind of a situation like we find many of us find ourselves in now. And we're, we're perhaps stuck somewhere. Just this morning, this morning, I received messages from two of my friends. One is a missionary, an American missionary in China. And uh, he texted me this morning and he said, I am stuck in Oklahoma. I'm stuck in Oklahoma. <laughs> I don't want to be in Oklahoma, but I'm stuck there. The second message I received was from a a a national pastor in Bangladesh. And here's what he said to me. He said, Pastor, I'm stuck in the Philippines. I'm trying to get to Bangladesh, but I can't get there. I can't get home. Well, we're, we're we're the same as Mary and Martha. We're saying, Jesus, what's the problem here? Why aren't you stepping up and helping me? We, we, We do the same thing. They were disappointed that Jesus did not respond to their request. But drop down to verse 21, if you would, please. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. So it's like an accusation here. If you had just responded, if you just done what I asked you to do, we wouldn't be in this mess. My brother wouldn't have died. Notice verse 22. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha doesn't understand. She, she doesn't know he's, he's about to perform this miracle for her. She, Martha verse says in verse 24, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. <clears throat> Jesus said unto her, now listen to this, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Not just in the last day, Martha. Not just in the resurrection. It's not just that you're going to, if you're a believer in Christ, you die, and then you're, you're, you're there in the grave sleeping until the resurrection. That's not it. Listen to the next verse. Verse 26, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? You see, Jesus made an incredible statement and promise here. He says that, that all those who believe in Jesus Christ, you'll never die. And it's based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, because he lives, we live also. Now, this promise is a conditional promise. This is not saying that the moment somebody dies, whoever they are, they immediately go into the presence of God and they live forever as angels or, or uh, whatever the, the current uh, thoughts are. No, this is a conditional promise. Those who believe in me, those who have received Christ as their Savior, those who have what Jesus called been born again in John chapter 3, He said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Those who have been born again, they have trusted Christ as their Savior. Christ is their Lord and their Savior. He made the promise that you will never die. Even though you'll die physically, you will never die spiritually. When we die physically, our body goes to the grave and our spirit, our soul, immediately goes into the presence of God. And Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. My friend, this is a conditional promise. Not long ago, my wife uh, made a little plaque and put it in our home, and here's what it says. Heaven, the vacation that lasts forever. Heaven is the vacation that lasts forever. Whenever we die physically, if we are believers in Christ, we've received Him as our Savior, we've been born again, we know Him as our, our personal Savior, we've been washed in the blood of Christ, the promise is that we will go right into the presence of God. I'm saying today that Resurrection Hope says that we have hope that whenever we leave this body, whenever we leave this veil of tears, we will be going right into the presence of God to live forever. We, we close our eyes in death on this earth. We open our eyes in the glories of heaven. Perhaps you're listening to me now and you're thinking to yourself, I don't believe that. Uh, I don't believe this pie in the sky, heaven, you know, you die and you go to heaven. I I don't believe all that stuff. Let me ask you a a question, my friend. You may say today, I don't believe that. But could I say this to you? Don't you wish you did? Isn't there something in your heart where you wish you could believe that? My friend, that longing, that desire in your heart is given to you by God. God wants you to believe this. I'm not talking about some phony pie-in-the-sky story that preachers make up to make people feel better about death. I'm talking about the words of the resurrected Savior. Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. 
If today you could find any trace of the body of Jesus Christ, if he had not resurrected from the dead, if you could find anything, if you could find a fingernail from Jesus, then we would be have to say none of this is true. But because Jesus rose from the dead, because he ascended back into heaven, applied his blood to the mercy seat, I'm telling you today, there is hope. That one, and not this pie in the sky hope. Hope in the Bible. When God uses the word hope, he's talking about an assurance that we wait with joy, knowing that God is going to fulfill it. Not only, number two, do we have this hope for the afterlife, but we also have the hope, the assurance that we can confidently wait for with joy. We have the hope that our journey through this life is under God's loving control. Look at Romans chapter 8, if you would please. In Romans chapter 8, there's an incredible promise that we oftentimes will use, we'll oftentimes quote, we'll oftentimes hold on to this promise of God. One of those keys that gets us out of that despair and able to walk on and to have joy and confidence. Romans 8, 28 is a wonderful promise. I, I quote it often, I use it often, I love this promise. I hold on to it, cling to it with, a, with all of my heart. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, think about the implications of that promise. All things work together for good. God did not say all things are good. I don't think this coronavirus uh, is good. Uh, I don't think the impli- I don't think our country being shut down is good. There are many things about what's going on in our lives today that is not good. It's not good that this morning there at Liberty you had to you had to watch your pastor Uh, online. You were not able to to, to congregate together in that beautiful auditorium that God has given you and that wonderful staff and your great pastor, all the rest of it. You weren't weren't able to be there live. That's not good. But God says all of these things are working together for good. He didn't say every issue is good. He He said He takes it all and He mixes it up and the end result is something that is for your good. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to his purposes. Now think about those implications. All things, everything, God is able to take even the bad things in life, even the discouraging things in life, even the hard things in life, and cause them to be used for our good. How can he do that? Verses 31 to 39 of Romans chapter 8 go on to explain what verse 28, how that can be. Listen to what he said. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us... So how can all things work together? Here's the explanation. If God be for us, then who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not, how shall he not with him, with Jesus, also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? Who can condemn us? Now listen to this. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, is risen again. (laughs) It's the resurrection of Christ. How do we know that all things work together for good? Because our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, stepped out of that tomb, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. After three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, Jesus did exactly what he said he was going to do. He said, no man takes my life, I give it, I lay it down freely, and I will take it again. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up again. I'll build it again. Then he went on to say this, verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? None of these things, nothing that we're going through can separate us from God's love. In all these things, verse 37, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Paul went on to say, I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, whatever the next, whatever the next tragedy is, whatever the next pandemic is, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. And all of it. Everything, nothing can separate us from God's love. Whatever comes into our life cannot separate us from the loving care that God provides for his children. And all of it is based upon the hope of verse 34, because Jesus died, yea, rather. Not only did he die, 
but he is risen again. And he's ever at the right hand of God making intercession. Let me tell you why this journey of tears and heartache makes sense. Because Jesus is alive. He rose again on the third day. And because of that, we have the assurance that he loves us. He cares. Does Jesus care? When my heart is pained too deeply for mirth or song. As the burdens press and the cares distress. And the way grows weary and long. Does Jesus care? When my way is dark with a nameless dread and fear. As the daylight fades into deep night shades, does he care enough to be near? Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me? My sad heart aches till it nearly breaks. Is it odd? Does he see? Does he care? Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. My dear friend, how do I know he cares? Because he went to Calvary. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. Now let me wrap this up by saying one more thing. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, we have hope. We can wait patiently with joy and confidence. Our eternity is secure. When we leave this life, we go into the presence of God We live with him in heaven forever. And our journey to heaven is secure as well. Because nothing can separate us from the love of God. Whatever comes into your life, God is in control. He loves you. He cares for you. But there's one more hope that I'm holding on to. Titus 2.13 says, We are looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. My friend, he's coming again. Jesus is coming again. I'll be very honest with you, very frank with you. My hope in this pandemic is that God is setting the stage for the soon return of His Son, Jesus Christ. Today could be the day that Jesus comes again. My question to you is is this. Are you ready? Are you ready? Look around the world. This global pandemic. The entire globe shutting down. We are getting ready for something big. For the Antichrist for the one world government. We're getting ready for something big. And before that happens, the next blessed hope is this. The sky will part. Jesus will come. He will call out to us, come up hither. We'll be caught up together with him in the clouds, ever to be with the Lord. Are you ready? If you're not ready to meet Jesus, if you do not know for sure that if Jesus comes tonight, you're going to be taken up at the rapture. Here's what I would encourage you to do. I'd encourage you to cry out to God right now, right where you are. Right there in the privacy of your living room or wherever you're watching this. Just cry out to God in your heart. If you, if you, you don't have to cry out out loud. Do it in your heart. He can hear you. <clears throat> cry out to God and say, Dear God, I'm sorry for my sins. I know I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus died for me. He was buried. He rose again the third day. Thank you, Lord Jesus for living, loving me, for living and dying upon the cross, for being buried, for rising the third day. Please come into my heart. Make me your child. Give me that hope. And if you will, my friend, you'll be ready to meet Jesus. And you can go from this moment on for the rest of your life having that hope, which is that confidence that we're waiting for Christ with joy and confidence. We're waiting. And we're in a period of waiting right now. But we can have joy and hope because we know that God is in control. And Jesus proved it by rising from the dead. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Thompson, for letting me uh, address your people. We love you. We miss you. We thank God for Liberty Baptist Church. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your love for us. I pray that if there's anybody viewing this video right now that's not saved, help them, Father, right now, this very moment, to call out to Jesus. And Lord, we know that you've promised that Whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out that you'll receive them if they'll receive you. May they do it today. And then, Father, for your people, may we have encouragement and hope. And, Lord, may we be trusting in you. Help us to take that key of the promises of God and use it to walk out of Doubting Castle tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.